Okay, so for part two of uh, homework one two, we will pick up with question seven. Um, in question seven, this is this is just another introductory calculation problem to make sure you're getting comfortable using the new equations that we saw today. Um, so hopefully this one was pretty easy, but if you want to check your answer, obviously feel free to do so. So they give us the acceleration of the space shuttle. They are asking how fast it's going at the end of the time. So we're looking for our final velocity, which is also just the velocity without a subscript. They tell me that the time is 55.2 seconds. And they do tell me again that it started from rest, so I know my initial velocity is zero. Um, so I've got my time, I've got my initial velocity, I've got my acceleration, um, and I'm looking for my final. So just consult your three equations, and again, the more you practice this, the more comfortable you get. But if you look at the equations, we can just use our first equation that we saw, right? because this is going to be the easiest one. I know these three measurements to find my final velocity. So I don't have to jump through any hoops, I don't have to do two equations, I can just do this once and be done. So my final velocity is going to equal my initial, which was zero, plus the acceleration of 53.9 meters per second squared, times the time of 55.2 seconds. Um, and I do want you to every once in a while notice units. I know I don't always follow these throughout, but it is good to do so because if we think about that, if I have meters per second squared times seconds, one of those seconds are going to cancel us out, right, cancel out, and then that's going to leave us with meters per second, which is what we want for velocity. So try and follow your units, because usually that will help us make sense of the entire equation. But in any case, I'm just going to take 53.9 times 55.2, and obviously I'll get a pretty large number from that. So 2,975.28 and probably dot, 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 right? But if I round this off to three significant figures, just because that's what they gave us, um, and it never hurts to go back and just keep thinking sig figs. Um, but if I do so, it's 2,980, 2,980, right? So there's my final velocity after 55.2 seconds. So hopefully this was a pretty easy one, um, but if you did want to check it, there you go. This question, on the other hand, is a little bit more tricky, and that's because it's it's got some subtle aspects that are very important for us to think about. So can an object under constant acceleration both come to rest and stay at rest and explain your reasoning. Okay, so the key here is the fact that they say that it has to both come to rest and stay at rest. Um, and it has a constant acceleration in doing so. So the answer is no, it can't. And let's look at why. Let's talk about why. And I know, obviously, you guys can write more of this down. I won't write because that will take too long. But I'll talk a lot of this through. Okay, so if something has a constant acceleration, the only way that it could remain at rest would be if that acceleration was zero. So if the object was not moving to begin with, if my initial velocity was zero, and the acceleration was also zero, then the object would remain at rest. But the problem here is, we cannot bring the object to rest in the first place if the acceleration was constantly zero. right? If the object was originally moving, so if my velocity was initially moving one way, the only way to bring the object to rest is to accelerate in the opposite direction. So if I had an object that was, at mo that was moving in order to come to rest, I'd have to accelerate against that. So let's follow this situation out, right? As the acceleration works against the object, eventually that object would kind of slow down, slow down, slow down until there is a moment in time where it comes to rest. But if we keep applying that same acceleration in that opposite direction, then even though the object momentarily comes to rest, it won't stay at rest because now I'm continuing to accelerate it to the left. So that object would pause for just a moment, but then it would begin to pick up speed and go back this direction. Um, so the problem here is, if we have constant acceleration, we cannot both stop and then remain stopped. You could do one or the other. You could either remain at rest if you were already at rest and your acceleration was zero, or you could come to rest if your acceleration opposed the velocity. But you can't do both with the same acceleration. It's just not possible, right? As long as that acceleration acts, we have to change velocity. And obviously, if we're changing velocity, you cannot stay at rest the entire time. Um, so anyway, this is a very good one to think about. Hopefully, that explanation, obviously, if you need to replay that explanation a couple times or ask any follow-up questions, feel free to do so. Um, but I won't spend a whole lot of time writing that out because that would take me a little while to do so. Um, so anyway, ask me questions if you have it, but otherwise hopefully that helps clarify the answer on this one.
question nine is back to what was hopefully an easier calculation question again. Um, so this one, they give us a car traveling in a straight line that has a velocity of positive five meters per second at some instant. Then four seconds later, its velocity is now eight meters per second. They ask us, what is the average acceleration during this interval? There is one of two different ways you could work with this. The first way is if you just started with the definition. So I'll call this part A, but it's just if you start with the definition for acceleration. The definition for the average acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. Right? So in this instance, I would say my final velocity of positive 8 minus my initial velocity of positive 5 divided by the 4 seconds that it took. So I'd have 3 over 4. And that would give me an acceleration of 0 0.75 meters per second squared. And do make sure you're getting comfortable with the units, by the way. But in any case, hopefully this one's not too bad. Um, and I'm realizing now that I'm starting to say in any case a lot. But anyway, this one hopefully wasn't too bad. The other way that you could approach this, it's really the exact same equation, but this is what we looked at in class, right? We saw the first of our equations for the kinematics, the kinematic stuff, is the final velocity equals the initial velocity plus a times delta t. This is truly just rearranging this, this definition of acceleration. So if I were to solve this, I get the exact same answer, right? My time again is 4 seconds. I'd obviously subtract the 5 over, divide by 4, and I get the exact same acceleration that I got before. So either of these routes are perfectly fine because they really are the exact same equation. They're just rearranged in a different format. Um, but hopefully this helped you if you needed it. Hopefully you didn't need it, but um, if you did want to check this one, there you go. Okay, so question 10 gives us another, and again, the first thing I always look for, it is a position versus time graph. Um, we will see more velocity versus time graphs moving forward, but make sure you're paying attention to the key differences, right, between the two. So anyway, they give us a whole bunch of information to find. So for part A, they want us to find the speed of the object from B to C. Well, the speed from B to C is actually pretty easy, hopefully, right, because we know on a position versus time graph, the slope tells me my velocity, right, and so in this case from B to C, my velocity would be zero because the slope is zero for a horizontal line. Okay, so the speed from B to C, the speed from B to C, or the velocity from B to C, either one of those would be zero meters per second. And we're gonna look at, with part B here, we're gonna look at the difference between speed and velocity. So it asked for part B for the speed from C to D. Well, if I was doing velocity, right, if I was doing velocity from C to D, I would find the slope. So again, my velocity from C to D, I would just truly count what's my rise, what's my run. So in this case, the fact that for the velocity, the fact that we're going down is important. So it looks like we go down from up here at 4 down to negative 5. So my rise would be a negative 9, and that happens over the span of it looks like just 2 seconds, right? So my velocity would be negative 9 over 2 meters per second. However, this question just asks us for the speed. And since speed is just a scalar quantity, I don't need the negative sign, I just need the magnitude. So the speed from C to D, very similar to the velocity, except I don't care if it's positive or negative, I just want the 9 halves, or if you prefer, 4.5 meters per second. Um, so that's the only difference there. Same idea right with part C, same idea with part C. They ask us what's the speed from D to E. Again, because it's a speed, I don't really care if it's positive or negative, but I'm still just looking at the slope. So from D to E, I, it looks like I rise by five because I go from negative five to zero, and then I go over eight, right? So my speed from D to E, again, it's we don't necessarily need the fact that it is a positive five over eight. Or again, if you want that in decimal form, you can write that in decimal form. Right, so 0 0.625 meters per second. Okay, so I don't have to worry about plus or minus if it says the speed instead of the velocity. If the velocity came into play, make sure we're paying attention to that. Um, and then D, indicate the times T when the speed of the object is zero. Well, we just identified one of our ranges, right? So if I look at this graph, the only time where the velocity or the speed is zero is any time it is horizontal. Well, from B to C, I know that my graph then is with a speed or a velocity that is zero. It does say the times, so rather than B to C, I'm gonna go ahead and indicate down here the actual times at which that occurs. So I'm gonna say from two seconds to five seconds. 
Um, if you prefer to think of it in the notation like you've seen with um, domains and ranges, you could say from two, and I'll go ahead and include two, but from two seconds to five seconds if you were using domain type notation. Um, but either of these is perfectly fine. And then finally, E, the points, if any, uh, where the direction of the object changes. So really all we have to do at this point is just look and see, right? From A to B, we're moving with a positive velocity. From B to C, we've stopped. So at this point, all we did was we slowed down and we stopped. But then at point C, right, I actually changed from having moved in the positive direction to moving in the negative direction. I start going the other way. So at point C, I do turn around. I go from the positive direction to the negative direction. And then at point D down here, I was going in the negative direction since I had a negative slope. And then all of a sudden, I turn around and I start moving in the positive direction. So this happens at both points C and D. Now we want to be careful because we don't necessarily know what the graph does before A and we don't know what it does after E. So these are the only, the only points we can confidently say um, that we, we have turned around at. So anyway, uh, question 10 here. Hopefully this helps to answer any, any questions you may have had on this one. I actually think because I'm starting to run short on time for this video, I'm going to go ahead and stop here and then that will give me plenty of time to talk through question 11, which was maybe one of the more difficult questions on this homework. Um, so I want to give it adequate time, so I'll stop this part here, and then the third part will have question 11 all to itself.